to see you this morning. Good to be out here today and uh, have another opportunity to uh, study, worship. Uh, as I said, pick each other up a little bit, lift each other up in thought, prayer, and uh, get our batteries recharged as we get in get into a, another week. I mean, we always hear the word as I've mentioned many times the weekend people work all week and look forward to the weekend and there's nothing wrong with that but the weekend is Saturday Sunday is the first day of the week it's not the end it's the beginning and for the believer the emphasis is is it's a great day that we can come out and worship the Lord uh, not just take a day off from the world uh, but give a time of the day especially this day uh, to re be reminded of our blessings and to show God that we are grateful for our blessings. Um, and uh, I'm sure you are. And uh, we'll have greater blessings even in eternity. We've spoken on those blessings. But uh, I wanted us to uh, just have a few lessons on a subject of divine inheritance, which we started Wednesday night, and we'll finish up at 11 o'clock today on this subject. I had four lessons, but I squeezed them into three. Someone said, you talk fast. And I said, well, I had a stroke when I was 37, and usually people slow down their talking. And I did for just a short while, and I, that probably could be worse. But anyway, let's get into this lesson. Oh, you've got a few questions in your bulletins, and uh, we are certainly... Uh, we're going to try to answer a few of those anyway. We might not get them all. But we'll see how we can get along with that. We talked about inheritance for time and eternity um, Wednesday night, and that God has a plan for us. And we brought out the parable that Jesus gave of the rich fool who had much possessions, had good crops, the ground was good to him. That's thank God for that. But he didn't have God on his radar. He just had building his nest egg. God was not on his radar, but, you know, his time in this world was going to come to an end abruptly. Matter of fact, Jesus said, your soul is required of you tonight. And you're tearing down your barns, building big barns, not just for your granary, for your grain, but also it mentioned that he had other things as well. And he had so much, he had to put it in storage. He didn't need it, but he would have it. And he was going to eat, drink, and be merry as it says there uh, in that Luke chapter 12 passage. And he was going to eat, drink, and be merry and uh, live it up. But the truth of the matter was he, didn't, he wasn't going to have a chance to live it up. He was going to die that night. God told him, you're going to die tonight. You need, and the moral of that story that Jesus was telling his, us as well as his disciples is that we need to look at where we're putting our emphasis and where our treasure is, for there is also where your heart is. Where your heart is, your treasure is, and vice versa. And so, uh, it's a telling thing when I spend too much time doing this or too much time doing that and not enough time doing this and praying and thanking God and doing whatever he wants me to do. And so, sometimes we all have to pull back a little bit from the things that we're doing, maybe a lot, uh, so that we can invest more in the treasury of heaven because that as Jesus says it won't rust and it won't diminish and it won't rot it won't the moth won't be able to eat the clothing there or whatever it won't diminish your account will always be the same it'll be a, a massive amount or a median amount or just a pittance of what you could have earned and that's one of the things that we talked about, the inheritance that we have in time, is that there's equal opportunity for every believer to take advantage of the word and to take advantage of the opportunities that you have as a Christian. So we talked about that, and we talked about the inheritance in eternity, and we talked about the fact that there's two kinds of inheritance. Uh, there's uh, the tactical inheritance, and there's the logistical inheritance. Two different types of inheritance. And so we'll talk about that just a little bit more this morning. And I've talked about uh, uh, that then, but we'll talk about conditional and unconditional inheritance this morning. 
uh, just to cover a few of the bases. We talked mostly about the unconditional inheritance. We'll talk about the conditional inheritance this morning. Things that you have because you're a Christian. Those are unconditional. And so we're going to talk about that in just a moment. Then get more into the unconditional, excuse me, the conditional inheritances. Things that we're responsible for. Uh, that God will bless us if we are responsible in those endeavors. Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for your word. We ask you to help us to take seriously our Christian life, but not take ourselves too seriously. Help us to realize that if there's anything that we accomplish, it's by your grace and your strength, not ours. And thank you that you're the one that keeps the score, not us keeping a score on one another. Or us even keeping a score on ourselves, and just that we walk in the light as you're the light. Thank you for this day of grace and for your word that we can get into, help us to understand it. In Christ's name, amen. First of all, I want to note that God's inheritance, and it's an inheritance from God by way of Christ, our mediator, our Savior. But God's inheritance is both heavenly and earthly, okay? So there's two worlds for that inheritance to survive in. There's one in heaven, and then there's part of that inheritance that we accrue as dividends in time. Your faithfulness to God in time, which is brought to light through trials and tribulations. When you're faithful, you're squirreling away treasure in heaven that will be rewarded to you handsomely as God can when you get to be with the Lord. But he's going to give you a little dividends on that blessing now. And he can give it to you in any way, fashion, or form that he wants to. It's an inheritance. Now, you have the unconditional inheritance of all believers get certain things. They get eternal life. That's the greatest. All your sins are paid for, so you inherit eternal life. You get the uh, revived human spirit is brought quickened. As Ephesians 2, 1 through 2 says, your human spirit is quickened. It's brought back to life. It was dead. We were born spiritually dead, so that's brought back to life. Now we can understand things and be encouraged in a way that you could never have been encouraged before because you're lost. Now God has something in you. He has, as it were, a chip in you or a software in you that pings from the server to you as the client. And so you have an IP address, as they say in computer speak, that matches an address in heaven because of Christ. That IP address is the blood of Christ. And since that match is there, that divine DNA is there, that righteous imputation that God has given you at salvation is there, God has a point of contact with you now. And with that point of contact now that you're saved, you get the divine emails. You get to understand the Word of God. The Holy Spirit then comes in as another part of the unconditional blessings or inheritance from God and the Holy Spirit becomes the down payment as Ephesians 1 13 says it becomes that principle that first bit of the blessings that you get for being saved eternal life the quickened human spirit for understanding spiritual phenomena as 1 Corinthians 2 12 and 13 and 14 tells us but then again you get uh, saved, you get kept, you get the indwelling Holy Spirit uh, as a down payment, as it were, and it secures you and seals you into the day of redemption. You have all those things. You have a tangible thing that's available to most Christians in places in the world is not is a Bible, where you can understand you have the Word of God. That's an unconditional inheritance. We didn't deserve that. Now, what you do with that is your business. You have an unconditional inheritance of the company of the saints. A lot of people don't see that, but that's a great thing. You have the company of the saints, fellowship. You have access 100% of the time to the throne of God. That's uh, uh, Hebrews 4 and verse 13. You have complete access to verse 14 and 13 and 14. You have access to the throne of God night and day. You've got access. A lot of people don't have access to power. 
They're saying, you know, I got to find my congressman's phone number, my senator's phone number, my attorney general's phone number. I've got to find the, the number, then I've got to go through their person, then their, their, their person's got to call the other person to set up the appointment. Well, you've got direct line straight to the, to the Lord's desk. A direct line. You don't have to go through uh, a priest. You don't have to go through, as you were in the military, your squad leader, your platoon leader, the company commander, the battalion commander, to get to the post commander, to get to the secretary of defense, to get to the president. You can go straight to the White House, as it were, with your request. You go straight to God with your request. Jesus, of course, is the mediator, so if we go through him, he's our high priest. But he's God as well. But you're going straight through him. Straight to him. And that which the Son wants, the Father will grant. Because the Son always knows what the Father wishes. That's unconditional. Every believer has that opportunity. No believer has an excuse for not growing up, not having an edification complex, not confessing their sins, not walking in the light as he is in the light. No believer has an excuse for that. No believer has an excuse for not reaping a great dividend of rewards and eternity at the Bema seat and wearing all kinds of crowns and medals for all eternity. No believer has an excuse because it's available. That's unconditional access. So that's an unconditional inheritance. That's yours that the world does not share in. And so this inheritance, according to 1 John chapter 3, creates within the believer a sense of purity, a desire to be pure. 1 John chapter 3, and the, old, and the little uh, one next to the little epistle next to the end of the Bible. 1 John chapter 3, Beloved, now we are the children of God, the and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that we shall, uh, that when he shall appear, uh, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Uh, we will have um, a body that will never die. Jesus, is, Jesus will never die again. You will never die again. And we will have a body that is without sin, which he never had other than our sin dumped on him. And uh, it will be a glorious thing at that time. And every man, verse 3 of 1 John 3 says, And every man or woman that has this hope, this confidence, who knows the Lord, trusts the word of God, whoever has this hope or confidence in him purifies himself even as Jesus or he is pure. So you have a desire to be more like Christ as you know you're going to look more like him in your makeup. You're not going to look like him in the sense that you're going to have perhaps a beard and, 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 and hair like his or the color of his eyes. That's not the point is that you'll have the same makeup of the same type of a body and uh, a glory that shines with you as well. So we'll have that. That's a great thing to anticipate. We're also reminded that God has an inheritance for his children that we will not receive until we die. There are certain things that we will not get until we die or raptured out, whatever happens first. Uh, there are some things that you're just not built to take, to handle yet. I'm not built to handle yet. I, my body and my emotions and my mind could not grasp it now. Things that he has for those who are saved unconditionally. He has things for you that you're, all believers are going to accrue or acquire when they get to heaven. That we don't have the capacity for in these failed bodies. We don't have the emotional capacity to, to, to grasp it. We don't have the mental acuity to grasp it. Physically, we would just collapse, as you saw pictures of Daniel. You saw John, uh, the apostle, when he saw that angel of the Lord, he fell right to his knees. He was so weak. The, uh, Daniel was so weak when he saw the angel, he collapsed. We couldn't physically handle it now. We're just not 
built for that. But in eternity with the glorified, resurrected body, we'll be built for it. We'll be able to handle it. That's something that God has an opportunity for all believers to experience. You know, we hate to see a loved one pass away, but if they're in the Lord, it's a wonderful forever, regardless if their life was wonderful or great as a Christian. We least rejoice that, yeah, now we know they're in a better place. And we talk when we were talking about our series in hell, it's really disingenuous to tell somebody that you're pretty sure was not a Christian to say, yeah, she's not in pain anymore. He's not in pain anymore. We try to say things to try to make a little bit of comfort. Best just not to say that. Just say anything, but don't just say that. Don't give some of the idea that when you die, at least you're not in pain anymore. Because if you're going, if you're gone to Hades, which eventually you're going to go to the lake of fire, you're going to be in pain for the rest of eternity. And you're not in a better place. And you're not with loved ones. We're so disingenuous trying to be uh, helpful that we can also give people the idea that they pass that information on down to their friends as well. When the preacher said, you know, I'm going to be all right, everything's going to be okay, when it's not the case. You're not cruel to them. Not a time to have a Sunday school class. But just tell them you're sorry too, and you'll be praying for them. Anything we can do to help you. Kind of leave it at that. Less is more when it comes to those circumstances. I've made those mistakes in the past before. I try not to make them again, trying to give people false hope. We also noted in our study that the inheritance in 1 Peter 1 4 is incorruptible. Just back up a few pages, and we'll be getting to this here in detail here before long anyway. But 1 Peter chapter uh, 1 and verse. Uh, Verse 3 says, uh, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again into a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is incorruptible and the file that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. It's an inheritance that is incorruptible. It is undefiled. It fades not away, and it's reserved. There's four things in that verse about your inheritance. Okay? Some of you might have got a, a handsome inheritance or may be planning on leaving a handsome inheritance to someone, and that's wonderful. It can help them out a little bit in this world, especially where the government robs you of a fourth of your year's income in taxes. I still harp on that as we got our personal property taxes yesterday. It's just like you work hard to have something and they can't stand it. I tell you what, they would open the casket and pull out, if you had a little bit of gold in your teeth, they'd pull every tooth in your head and try to find it. That's just how bad our government is. They would. Looking for, you know, does she have an ankle bracelet on? Let's get that bottom side open up there. Don't wear anything of value. The government might be coming after it. Just leave it for somebody. I've seen people pass away and they want that casket closed with that nice gold ring on there, you know, and this, that, and the other. I don't know that they ain't dug back up and stole off of them. I don't know. Computer chip put in your chest might have a little bit of value to it, a little bit of gold or a little bit of what you would call it in there. Oh, we'd get that. They're terrible. Let me get off of that. Well, we have an inheritance that is incorruptible. <laughs> also, we have been redeemed. We've been brought, bought out of the slave market of sin. Now, all believers have been bought out of the slave market of sin to someday receive an inheritance that is incorruptible, undefiled, that fades not away, that's reserved in heaven. When the Lord gives you eternal blessings, it's exactly what that blessing means. It's eternal. Okay, And your eternal blessings don't wait until you get to heaven. They start the moment you get saved. You're already li lined up for the unconditional blessings. But the Lord wants to do more than that. And we know that. We'll see that. 
also this unconditional inheritance, I said, as I said, it goes out to all believers and that we are all heirs of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 8 and verse 17. Romans chapter 8 and verse 17. So we got to be cautious, and that's what I'm, my thinking is behind these couple of messages, is that we have to be aware in our own thinking of where our emphasis lies. Romans chapter 8, verse 14, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the huios, the adult, mature children of God. You see, the immature believers, you may be immature for a while, but again, a part of the unconditional inheritance that all believers have is that they can all get to maturity and then qualify for wonderful blessings that come under the category of conditional inheritance. There are some things you have to qualify for, and that's what I mean by conditional inheritance. The unconditional blessings and inheritance that you receive at salvation position you for wonderful life, position you and I for great blessings, both now and eternity. But it's what we do with those things, the Word of God, the Spirit of God, our human spirit, our volition, all those things, and our opportunities. It's what we do with them that determines whether or not we'll have these great things. But the believer that's positive is led by the Spirit of God. It means to be pulled, but you're willing to be pulled. There are some believers that the Spirit of God can prompt them every Sunday to roll out of the bed and go to church, and they won't do it. And they know they should. They're saved, but they're waiting on something to get straight in their life. They're waiting for this to get this way and that to get that way. They're not willing to be led of the Spirit. They see, and during that, in that interim period, there's a lot of wallowing and misery. Because in disobedience, as a Christian, you can't be happy. God will not let you be happy because His Spirit can't allow it. God can't be one, one, th one thing one day and something else the other. You'd say, well, at least Sunday's over with. Mom, it's Sunday's never over with. They say, well, it's just another day of the week. It is not to God because what you do on Sunday has a lot to do with your attitude the rest of the week. If you can say, I'll just chuck it. How would you like to get chucked the next six days? No, it's important. It is important. It's important. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, the word led, present, passive, indicative, subject of the verb, receives the action of being pulled along. Present tense means you're regularly, and as I have in my notes, holy violence. <laughs> holy violence. Sometimes God has to really help us or boot us or whatever, but we're willing. We're willing. It's because it's scary. Faith is a scary life. God calls on us to walk a life of faith to, to give of our gifts. That we're, maybe it's a little tight for us. We all understand, especially in today's climate, what that's like. To get the sad look from your family because you're not involved in all the things that they like to do on <coughs> Sunday. And you're, they're giving you the stink eye because you're not with them. I've talked to too many people as a pastor who would come out, they say, but our family's doing this, our family's doing that, and it's the only day we've got to spend with the kids and this, that, and the other. Do you realize that that's going to come back to bite you on the backside at your day of judgment? <clears throat> they don't care. They're blind. They're deceived by the fact that they're doing a good thing, and it's equal to the blood of Christ. It's equal to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, and they're just dead wrong. You can have both. The sin nature will tell you that you can't. You can have a good family life. You can have faith. You can have that. That's the sin nature that deceives us into thinking that I can't be a good husband 
unless I do whatever my family or my friends want me to do. Well, what if your family wants you to be with the Lord in the Lord's house that day? Then you just find another excuse. Yeah. Work, whatever. Friends, whatever. I'm tired. I need to rest up. You depend on me to keep a roof over your head, don't you? And all that kind of stuff. No, I depend on God to keep a roof over my head, and I expect you to listen to him. That's what a wife needs to tell her husband. I expect God to keep a roof over my head, and I expect you to listen to him. How about them apples? <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> All right. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the children of God, the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage to fear. But you receive the spirit of adoption. So that's unconditional. That's setting the table for you having great blessings in time and in eternity. You have not received a, 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 a spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't fear anything. And he doesn't give you that. Only Satan gives you that fear. Because you've got faith. You don't have to live by fear. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. But you've received the spirit of adoption. You're in the family of God. You cry, Daddy, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our human spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then we are heirs, heirs of God. Unconditionally, we are heirs of God. And conditionally, it doesn't say that there, but that's what joint heirs mean, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And here's why I'm saying that the second one is conditional heirship because it has a caveat to it. We are all heirs through faith in Christ of God, but we are all, and we can be joint heirs with Christ if so be that we are suffering with him that we also may be glorified together, that is, with him. You're saved. Are you taking advantage of that, in other words? So we receive things in time from God as a part of our inheritance, Salvation, eternal life, <coughs> indwelling Holy Spirit, human spirit, the Word of God, company of believers to grow in, local church now in this New Testament as a place where we can come in and safely have a classroom of, of study. But quite often we ascribe riches and earthly treasures to some sort of a temporal inheritance. We do. We often ascribe riches and earthly treasures to an inheritance. Though by the grace of God they may be granted to you, they're not the kind that the Bible is talking about. They're not the kind that God intends for the believer to put their focus on. As per Proverbs chapter 11, uh, let me just read Proverbs 11 verse uh, 25. Proverbs 11 25 says, The liberal, that's not pol polit politics there, uh, the liberal soul, the one who... Uh, freely trust the Lord, uh, the one who is generous with the Lord and everything else, the liberal soul shall be made fat, and he that watereth shall be watered also himself. God's going to take care of you for what your needs are. But 1 Timothy 5, 8 says, But if any provide not for his own, especially those of his own house, he has denied a faith and is worse than an infidel or the unsaved. So when it comes to inheritance, God may grant earthly inheritance to you. That is of the physical nature. But God, Jesus said, I will take care of doing that for you if you will seek first the kingdom of God. And that's the problem. We don't seek first the kingdom of God often in Christianity. We seek the kingdoms of this world. And then the kingdom of God things never fall on our plate. If we seek first the things of God, these other things, according to Proverbs 11 and verse 25 and 1 Timothy 5 and verse 8, those things will be taken care of for us. God's inheritance should be looked at as something that we do not own nor can get from this world, but as an opportunity to get closer to the Lord 
and be able to depend upon it. As I said, you have to earn from the world what you need for survival. Even the birds have to go out to get the worm. But God's inheritance is actually a supernatural inheritance. And it's given in such a way that proves that, that it came from God. Have you ever received a blessing from the Lord that you had no idea was coming down the pipe to you? That it was totally took you back and you had no idea. It may have not been a money or something like that. It could have been a break in your medical care. It could have been a, a break in your relationships, a new friend or whatever. And you thought, wow, I didn't realize that that gym was right there in my neighborhood. I didn't realize that I had such a blessing just being right here with you. People that have lived in houses that their families have owned for generations and one day they decided to do a renovation and great-great-grandpa hid gold in the wall. And they've been struggling for decades. They finally decided we need to get some work done on that wall. And they find that or some artifact or whatever and it helps them out of their sore spot. It's only though temporary. God's blessings are forever. The greatest unconditional inheritance believers receive is the opportunity to qualify for advanced inheritance. Just as someone may work, want to work for a good company to get in the door because they may take an entry-level position, but being on the ground floor means that you have got nowhere to go but up. Unless you do something stupid and then you're out. But you get in the door because the benefits are wonderful and the potential to rise is wonderful. The same it is in Christianity. You're in the door, though, you won't get fired and the potential to rise through your humility and knowledge of the Word of God is unlimited because the one who causes you to rise is unlimited. Never forget that God has no limitations. He has no limitations. We might think small. Don't think small. Think God. Think God. Don't think small. It's easy to think small because you think within your own bank account. You think within your own abilities. Don't think small. Think God. And ask God for whatever he wants to. You know, Solomon didn't ask for all the stuff that he got. He just asked for wisdom and knowledge to lead to people. And God says, you know what? You didn't ask for a bucket full of money. I'm going to give you that to boot. And you'll be the richest man that ever walked the face. And he still, I believe, is the richest man that has ever walked the face of the earth, even compared to today's uh, money markets. So another example that of that unconditional inheritance is that of course is eternal life that's inherited by every believer all of these inheritances are something God has that you cannot buy because it brings the opportunity for joy and happiness a sense of forgiveness peace and everything that follows that another example is is the eternal life is inherited by all believers at salvation all these inheritances, again, are something that God has that you cannot purchase. All right, now, conditional inheritance. This is the second category. There's unconditional inheritance. All believers receive at salvation, will receive in heaven certain unconditional things that are by the grace of God. But conditional inheritance, when that is the spoils of Christ's victory. I'll ask you to turn to a familiar for some of you, Isaiah chapter 53 passage. Isaiah, the Old Testament prophet, chapter 53. You get through the Psalms and the Proverbs, Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon, you're going to come up against Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 53. These are given out to the believer who, according to our earlier text, And Romans chapter 8 is willing to put themselves out there for Christ's sake, regardless of the circumstances, because you love him and you trust him. And that's what you've got to do. If God's going to use you, you have to love him and you've got to trust him. You've got to trust him. I've got to trust him. Satan will do everything he can to cause me to not trust God like he did Adam and Eve. 
He will do everything he can to get you to not trust God. You can trust him. He's always come through for you. What makes you think that he won't continue? You're expecting to come through for you when you die. Expecting to come through for you when you're living. That's what I must do. But the first part of Isaiah chapter 53 tells of who Christ is. He's like a tender plant, like a root that was pulled out of dry ground, verse 2. He had no form or beauty or comeliness. And when we shall see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him because he was made to look so disfigured according to Isaiah 52 and verse 14. His visage was so marred more than any man that his form more than the sons of men that they didn't he was unrecognizable when he was on the put on the cross, beaten so bad. And then he was, of course, not only that, but despised and rejected, verse 3 says. He was a man of sorrow, acquainted with grief. And we hear, as it were, our faces from him. There are a lot of people in the world who are hiding their face from him right now. And that does not break my heart. What breaks my heart that there are people who at one time in their life said yes to Jesus and they're hiding their face from him this morning. That breaks my heart to no end. How, how in God's name could you hide from Jesus on Sunday morning? How? And have the gall to think, well, I know I got saved when I was young or I got saved a long time ago. I know I'm going to heaven. Uh, Paul said you might want to double look, check that. Because to my knowledge, the Holy Ghost knows where you are and he will burn you a new one if you don't get squared away. God just does not do that. That just galls me to no end for people who say they're saved and they could tell God to kiss off today. And I'm telling people on Facebook, if you say you know Jesus and you won't get up and go to church, you don't have to come here. You'll hear these kind of sermons if you come here. But if you'll tell God you're not going to go to church, you're telling God to kiss off. You're flipping him off. You're giving him the bird today. How many Christians give God the bird on Sunday? Because they might as well. Because they're acting like the world. You don't tell God to kiss off. Look what Jesus... Anytime I read Isaiah 53, I get emotional simply because he bore our griefs. And I'm going to tell you what, I had a bucket full of them. <laughs> Verse 4, He has surely borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He was wounded for our transgressions. We all, verse 6, we're like sheep. We done gone off the cray-cray. We turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him. God has God laid on him the iniquity of us all. Verse 10, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul, not just his flesh. It wasn't magic blood. It, that's the life of the flesh is in the blood. But he gave up his soul. And the loss of blood was simply a symbol that the loss of life was there. Of course, Jesus didn't bleed out or bleed to death. He gave up the ghost of his own free will. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul, and the just shall be satisfied. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify, declare righteous many. For he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. These are greater grace blessings because he has poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So we have what we call logistical blessings that are something that all believers are given opportunity for. And then we call these this a tactical blessing or tactical inheritance or conditional inheritance where you qualify because you're the strong. You're the one who exploits the logistical, uh, unconditional, unconditional blessings that you are given. A lot of believers don't take advantage of the unconditional blessings they're given. They see it as optional. It's like a man 
starving to death in the city streets and he's got a hundred two hundred three hundred dollars or a thousand dollars sewed up in the lining of his coat and he won't pull it out and use it to buy food or shelter or whatever or health care for something always saving it what in the world are you saving yourself for put it all out there and just let God take care of you on those conditional blessings they are the spoils of Christ's victory that only some believers will qualify for. Romans 8 and verse 17, because they're willing to suffer unconditionally the rigors of living a disciplined Christian life. Now, that doesn't mean you're not happy. It just means that you're devoted. Those who will let themselves be identified with the suffering of Christ by voluntarily submitting to the conforming work of God and spiritual metamorphosis are referred to in Isaiah 53, 12 as the strong. They are also seen in Philippians chapter 1. I'm going to turn to Philippians chapter 1, Galatians, Ephesians, and Philippians 1 and verse 20. And verse 21 and verse 29. Philippians. I'll read it here. You might want to jot it down. Page 1281 in my Bible, but maybe not yours. <laughs> in Philippians chapter 1, verse 20, Paul said, According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with the all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death, for me to live Christ and to die gain. For me to live is Christ, to die it's gain. In verse 29, Paul said, For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on... Look at here. For unto you it is given in behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. And if you say, I'm a Christian, I've really never suffered for my testimony as a Christian then you're going to come up as a pauper at the beam of seat of Christ if you're saved. That doesn't have to be the case. It's your choice. It's not only our choice to believe, it's our choice to be devoted after we've accepted Christ as Savior. That's why sometimes Sunday school is so half empty because there are those who have believed but they have not gotten devoted yet. I don't come in here and have a bless me party. We're here to learn. And there are a lot of people who have the opportunity to learn, but do not take advantage of it. They either think they know it all, or I don't know what I'm talking about. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, don't bother showing up at 11 o'clock. You have an opportunity that you're just, I'm not going to say it, missing, letting go and get away from you. Do not let it get away from you. Do not let it get away from you. Seen too many people's lives end, as we said the last few weeks in our study, the last lesson on Jonathan Edwards, my pain is greater than I can bear. Don't let it be that as a Christian, though, at the being of seat of Christ. You know, the Bible says that they'll be wiping away all tears. Wonder why? Because you see all the things that you could have gotten going up in a puff of smoke. That's one reason. Don't let that happen. Philippians 3, verse 7, Paul said, What things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. And it includes that extra hour on Sunday. Those things that I counted gain for me, I counted loss. That extra hour of sleeping really wasn't worth it. That extra hour of this, that, and the other really wasn't worth it. The extra time during the week to try to talk to somebody, and you had the chance and you wouldn't do it, you know, read your Bible, do those things, pray. You go ahead and do those things, but you what you fill it in with is something else. I must be careful of this as well. <clears throat> if they're not a gain for me from the eternal perspective, they're not a gain. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but refuse that I may keep on acquiring learning of Christ 
be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, of course, but that which is through the faith of Christ, that righteousness, which is of God by faith. So those things are there. 2 Timothy 2.12 details that there is a crown for those who suffer for Christ's sake. So there's conditional inheritances. Romans 8, 14 through 17, as we read earlier, describes the mature believer who's led by the Spirit of God. This believer is so in tune with God's leadership that they are sold out for God's control of their life. And they're willing to take whatever comes. Romans 8, 14 speaks of a Christian being willing to be led. Hagao, hagao means to pull, we said. God will pull you through the rubble if he has to. He'll, he'll pull you through a neighborhood that you don't really feel comfortable in at times, and you'll talk to people, at least call them and get in contact with folks. That if he's pulling you there, he's going to protect you there. Wherever God pulls you, he protects you. He provides for you. We put all three P's in that pod. Pulling, protecting, and providing. Probably think of a few more if you want to put a few more P's in that pod. But this believer will not jump ship and scrap Bible doctrine because life has thrown him a curveball. This believer will not be satisfied with substituting anything in church in place of the instruction from God's Word. They're not going to trade in the Bible for the band. But there are a lot of churches that would leave those churches if it wasn't for the band. They're not there for the Bible. And they're there for performance and not the perception of truth. This believer will not be satisfied with substituting anything in place of instruction from God's word. In the local church, this believer does not look for patsies or excuses for not coming to Bible class. This believer is not distracted by a musical smorgasbord of entertainment. God is building a trophy Christian here, and he only uses gold, not hay, wood, and stubble. The Lord does not build trophy saints out of hay, wood, and stubble. The, the believer allows God then, this positive believer allows God to come into his thoughts, thoughts through biblical instruction. The Lord heats up the fires of refinement to purify this believer's thoughts through teaching. And sometimes the undeserved suffering that comes with your acknowledgement of those taught lessons. But regardless of the heat of your trials and the testing, you keep coming back for the word. You have said in your heart that it's going to be God's way or the highway. The Spirit of God sees your positive volition and rejoices within you. And that's when your peace really gets wonderful. It is said they are the huion or the huios, the sons of God in Romans 8, 17. The typical Greek word there is technon, which means simply a child. But here, these are people who want to be mature for God's glory. Again, we're all heirs in Christ because we're saved and have unconditional blessings and inheritance from God in time and in eternity. But not every believer is a joint heir because of their volition to be drawn by God to a place of maturity where your greater focus is without excuse. Christians have got to stop making excuses. We've got to stop making excuses. Paul said he was hard on himself. That he not get caught up in the sin and selfishness. That has not changed. We have to be hard on ourselves as well. And be disciplined. And be studious. And then let the Spirit of God work out in us the plan of God uh, as God sees fit. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this time together, for your word, for the truth that sets us free liberates us from the bondage of sin and selfishness. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.